Hello, and welcome to Making Interactive NFTs. I'm Dr. Abstract. And in this episode, we're going to do something special. We're going to take you through FX Hash and some of the things that we do every time we make something in FX Hash. And we'll show you how FX Hash works, talk a little bit about rarity. And that way we don't have to keep on going over that same stuff in each of our episodes when we talk about FX Hash. So this is FX Hash as opposed to TIA. We have a bunch of interactive works on TIA. Now, TIA works a little bit differently or has a different focus perhaps. With TIA you mint a bunch of the same NFTs. Now you don't have to, you could possibly use the whoever is purchasing like the wallet ID to seed a certain NFT for a certain person or a wallet. But most of the time, or at least with all of our examples anyway, when you, uh, well, when you make an NFT in TIA, you might mint 50 of them and they're all the same. And then people buy those 50 things. With FX Hash, it's a little bit different. First of all, you, the creator, don't mint uh, the 50. You wait and have the collector mint their own version. And that own version uh, looks different than other people's versions. Or that's the idea. So this is our latest one called Visitors. And this is the code we're going to look through as well. So let's press on that one. And there's a visitor. If we hit the variations, you can see that we get different visitors, ooh, like that. And so uh, nobody knows quite which visitor they're going to get until they mint one. And that's the fun of it. You know, it's like we're not sure if we're going to get a rare one. We hope that we will. And so these people have minted the visitors down below. And you can see that there's a number of different ones. They also have different um, feature values. So they, they all have arms, but this one has the average number of arms, and that's the rarity. Uh, the energy is the little type of pixels, and this one is diamonds, which is the smallest type of pixel, and that's 28% of them have that. The reveal, which is how uh, bright the, the lines are in the background, that... Um, there, there's five different types of them. So what we've done is we said there's five of these, five of those, five of those, four of these, the vortex levels. This one has one, two, three, four, five vortex levels, and that's rare. So that's um, that's giving them something that's more collectible in, in total there, the total rarity. And then we have the speed at which the, the uh, pixels are moving, not the speed at which the whole thing goes back and forth. The speed at which the whole thing goes back and forth is the same each time. Anyway, we're, we are doing an episode specifically about the visitors uh, NFT, but this episode is just about the rarity and how we set that kind of stuff up there. So anyway, the speed is cautious, which is, ooh, that's good too. That's, that's attributing to rarity. That means it's the slowest, I think. So let's go in and take a look at the code that's in behind that, that portion of the rarity, okay? We'll reduce this down, move it over. Here's the code for visitors. It's all in a visitors folder. And we have a link down below uh, to the Zim NFTs. And in that link there, it shows a video about how to set up your folders and how to upload this to FX Hash. So that's not what this is, video is about, but uh, just quickly, you should have all of your things locally there. So there's our local scripts. And then we're calling our local scripts with FX hash. I believe you have to put the dot slash in front. I'm not sure. With Tia, you don't have to. And then what we've done is we've zipped up these things inside of a zip folder here. Note that we did not zip the whole folder. That won't work with FX hash. You have to go into the folder and zip the index and any subsequent folders. And that's what you subs that's what you upload to FX hash. All right, so that was just a quick part of that. But what I want to do in this video is talk about what this does. This is the code that we get from FX hash right here, as well as talk about what our Zim rarity does. So we're going to go over rarity because each of the FX hash ones, we're doing rarity. And so rather than talking about it in each one, we're talking about it in this one. And we'll point to this video if you need to watch it and then you only get to see it once. <laughs> Yay. 
And then uh, I suppose the final part or close to the final part is sending the information. So this is that rarity information that we're sending to FX hash where they're picking it up. Uh, the last step I suppose with FX hash is in the FX hash code up here. They have a FX preview, FX preview function right there. And we call that down at the bottom after a certain amount of time, we know it's drawn. We call the FX preview after 1.5 seconds. So these are the things that we do all the time. Uh, sometimes when we call this depends, like if we're making some mustaches, we wait till the mustaches are made and then we call the FX preview. In this case, it all loads right away. And we're just giving it a little bit of time to call that preview. Okay, so back to the FX hash code. Hopefully this is exciting, yay. Uh, we may have gone, you may have seen this before. We've gone over a Zim Explore where we talked about this as well. We've made a couple changes to it as well. So this is the latest version. We didn't make any changes to this part. This is the FX hash, but for a rarity, we did. Anyway, the FX hash, what it's doing is anytime uh, a collector mints an NFT from what is called the generative token. <laughs> Lots of verbiage in there. <laughs> so with FX hash, we don't really mint the NFTs. We, the creator mints uh, a generative token. I prefer to call it makes a generative token. And there it is up there. And then the collectors will mint an NFT from that generative token. So anytime a collector mints, it, it they get a unique ID, something like this, and that's called a hash. So another word for this is a hash because it's sort of hashing an ID from this into, uh, you know, into this random ID basically right there. So if we, if we just refresh this page, let's have a look here. So I'm gonna open this in a browser. Here it is in a browser. So I'm going to get random visitors. Every time I refresh, I get a random visitor because every time I refresh, I'm getting a random hash number, a random ID, all right? But when they mint, it will solidify on one specific ID, such as this one. So imagine that we now have one specific ID and let's take a look and see what happens. So we've hard coded the ID, that's what it looks like, and it moves off to the right. I refresh, that's what it looks like, and it moves off to the right. I refresh, that's what it looks like, and it moves off to the right. So you see, if you have a specific ID, then you get a specific piece of art, okay? Right, so this is a pseudo random number generator. We're not going to go over the code of what's in there. This is provided by FX hash, and they're using that to get a hash when they need it. They also return somewhere in here um, an FX rand. So that's a random ID that we can use and we do. We use that ID right here, that random ID to seed our random number generators, which is actually goes back to the JavaScript random number generators. Because in Zim, we're randomly picking from things. In here, we, we are doing random calls here to position stars, we're doing wiggling things to move things. So um, down below this wiggle right here is what is moving our visitor in the X between 100 pixels and 200 pixels each time, between five seconds and 20 seconds. So randomly in there. Well, all those random things we want to be the same uh, for a specific ID. And that's why we seed the random number, which is right here. So we're seeding JavaScript's random number using a Zim command, like so. Okay, so that's what this stuff is doing up there. That's the FX hash code. I believe there's a way in here that you can ask for random numbers based on the seed, but uh, we don't need to do that because Zim's got a whole bunch of ways that it uses random numbers, and therefore we need to seed our own, but using that FX hash ID. Um, another thing that we do commonly is we present the, the information that we're going to put on FX hash in, in the description of the NFT. We put that in here as well as a comment, and that way it's locked in on the interplanetary file system as well. And so that's kind of cool. 
when we do our information each time, we usually put please see Dr. Abstract's creations. Uh, you, you obviously don't want to put that, but <laughs> you might want to put your own name there. And that encourages people to, or reminds them to, hey, uh, if you like this NFT, maybe you should see some of the other ones as well. And so we put that right in our info along with little arrows pointing up. That ends up looking like this. So there it is right there. Okay, nice and early, and then they can go up and take a look at Dr. Abstract's other NFTs as well. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There, by the way, is the link to Zim NFT specifically, and that will have video in it. Well, why don't we go take a peek? That will have video in it that shows you how to set up all the rest of the stuff as well. So here's the Zim NFT page. That would link back to the Zim site. Uh, and if we scroll on down here, there's an article that encourages people who are coming from processing. Very common to make stuff with processing. Zim is very similar to processing. Uh, as you'll see, we're using the generator, a Zim generator, to do exactly what processing does with, with um, relative drawing and pushes and pops and stuff like that. But Zim's got a lot more things, uh, such as components, conveniences, and controls. And this article right here will uh, introduce you to Zim and sort of say how we can make tools to make art. And that's a little bit different than making the art. So we, we are interactive media more so than uh, generative art, which is almost pure code quite often. Uh, we provide a bunch of components that help you make tools to make art. <laughs> Isn't that neat? So that's why this series is called Interactive NFTs, is because we're really good at making interactive NFTs. So if you want to find out about that whole world, that's a great article to read. And then there's other ones as well in here. We have... Uh, an article on creating interactive NFTs with Zim that goes through the process on Hicketnunk or Hicketnunk based things. Hicketnunk's gone, uh, but Tia, or is it back? I don't know. Anyway, Tia is another one, OBJKT, etc. So that's the setup video for that one. We are talking about Zim, the Zim NFT specifically here. And then here's Zim on FX Hash, including the how to make FX hash uh, generative art on Medium and a video on how all that stuff set up. Okay, so there you go. Uh, we talk specifically about odds and rarity, and there's a link to the FX hash template. All right, these are then ones that we've made. Okay, so coming back then to our code. Ba doop boop. Um, we are going to talk about rarity now. So the idea behind rarity is that it will make, uh, like, uh, it'll, it'll make these things with certain frequencies. So why don't we look at the vortex level first, because it's a bit easier, a simpler format, and this is a more complex format. So the vortex level is basically how many, uh, um, levels we've got. <laughs> All right, so there's just two levels, two. So it will always have at least two. I can't even tell on that one. Can't tell on that one. Can't tell on that one. There's just two on that one. There's, it should be an easier, oh, there we go. That's three. One, two, three levels on that one. Uh, that's three levels. And it might go to five levels or what have you. And sometimes you can tell more easily. That was a, more of a vortex. My apologies. <laughs> I'm looking for a five, a nice easy five. One, two, three, four. That's got a vortex level of four anyway. All right, so we're, we're putting the answers here. Two, three, four, five. And then these numbers are 50% chance of it being two, 20% chance of it being three, 20% of four, and 10% five. So in other words, this is the frequency that these will appear in our select our, our pool, in a sense. And what rarity does is it actually returns an array. So that's the rarity function right there. And what it does is it returns a, an array, a randomized array that has 52s in it, 23s in it, 24s in it, and 10 fives in it. And since it's a randomized array, we just take the first one, and that's going to pick one of these values based on its frequency. Um, just beware that it could be, say, 
like that. It doesn't have to add up to 100. Uh, making it add up to 100 is a bit easier because then we can say, oh, 20% of the time. But now, if it doesn't add up to 100, this just means 5 out of 5 plus 20 plus 20 plus 10. Okay, so that's the odds of getting a 2. So it doesn't have to add up, and that's basically the rarity format. And then we pick one of those just uh, by hitting it there. We could have made the rarity return a single value, but it's sometimes handy to have multiple, like a pool to pick from, and I might pick seven things from there, and yet those seven things are gonna be picked with the, uh, the desired rarity, okay? So that's a simple format, but sometimes we don't want to use the number directly. That may have been something that you noticed on our FX hash, and it's quite important, or at least important to us, and, and maybe might be important to you. We could have said the number of arms are five or 10 or seven or whatever, and given a number there. But instead, we're using words because when there's a lot of arms, this is magnificent. And magnificent, is fun, you know, that, that means something. It's like storytelling. Oh, we've got a magnificent one. So we now have energy. Energy could have just been a size or a five by five or whatever, because that's what that's what we're using. We're using three by three or five by five or seven by seven or one by seven, that kind of thing. Those are that's the data we're using. But we don't want to tell you that for energy, so instead we've made something up. And same with all these other ones. We like to use words instead of numbers. Uh, the reveal might just be true or false, who knows? But instead of using true or false, we're, we're doing something else. Like when we do the, the watches here, back on. Here are the Time Lord watch bands. Ooh. So let's go have a look at a Time Lord watch band. Here's one right here. So there's the lineage. The lineage is going to be somebody's name here, but instead of saying true or false there for the lineage, we're saying mysterious. So mysterious means that we don't know who, who that is. Or one of the other ones, I don't know if we can see it. on. Yeah, these other ones, they have a name there. So if we press on this one, Lord whatever. <laughs> and, and there, a lord. There's also a lady. So we're using words there instead of um, booleans or numbers or, or whatever. Okay, so I think that is good to talk about. And that's one of the nice things about our rarity setup is what we've got is you can have the words that will be selected. So uh, another thing, by the way, that you should do is you should batch things. So say we had 20, or we could have had more to two, instead of giving a number between 20 and two, so yeah, somebody's got 17, somebody's got four, somebody's got, those ones are gonna, there's gonna be too much rarity in there. If we're only minting 40 of them, that means that the odds are, you're going to be a single, you know, you're going to have the rarest or possibly slightly less rare. But you, you see what I mean? That's that's too many things. Definitely do, do not make, here's a hundred options and then everybody's going to have a very rare thing. Um, so what you do is you sort of batch them. And what we're doing here is it's not really the number of arms. It's the angle between the arms is 20. So that will make less arms, minimal. Angle between is 10, angle between is five, four, and two. So when the angle between is two, we have many arms, and that is, we are, we're calling magnificent. All right, so we just sort of say, hey, these are representatives here, and that's what we're going to show. That's enough variety, I think. And then rarity is decided, it's only 2%, no, it's 10% that it's going to be that, and 10% on, on the other one. So these ones are going to be more rare in the end, whereas the average is 40%. Okay, so what's this other thing though? Well, uh, we've got the word, but instead of using a word, we, we actually need to have some data. We need that angle. So we're calling this the payload. In this case, we're going to use the number directly. So we didn't put a word in, we have no payload. So that's a simple case, but uh, I find that most of the time we want to provide a word, yet use a number as data. And so we call that the payload. This is the frequency, frequency, or the odds, frequency. And then this is the payload. And it can be anything. It could be a string, it could be a new circle, it could be an array, an object literal, etc. Who, who knows what the payload is? Doesn't matter. So let's see how this is used then. 
arms, if we're going to tell fx hash some stuff, arms, we tell it arms. That is going to be minimal, de delicate, average, many, or magnificent. But when we want to use this, and down below, when we want to use it, here it is right here, arms.payload. And now that's going to be the, the, we're taking 360 and dividing it by that num, which is really just the angle, and then we're rotating it by the angle as well, those rectangles. So that's how we're using it there. What we did is we made this first, and then we added these things right here afterwards. Often you'll do that, you'll hard code some stuff down here, or we made it, we could just change that. And so if we change that to two, remember this is going to be magnificent. So if I come in here, as we were building, that has a lot of arms. Isn't it magnificent? It's really magnificent. <laughs> Whereas if we had a larger angle in here, such as uh, 20, like that, then it will be uh, more sparse, like so. Okay. So that's what we were doing as we were building it, and then we applied the fx hash stuff afterwards. And what was this again? Arms.payload, like that. There we go. And that will take the value that was in the payload and use that. So rather than using the word uh, for arms, rather than using the word, it takes the payload. Okay, so hopefully that's good. Um, down below, uh, we run into a little bit of a snag if we want to pass an array. Uh, so in this case, our payload is an array. So that would normally, you would think, look like this. And it's not often that we want to send an array as payload, but maybe it is, who knows? And we should be able to do that. Problem with that is Zim has this thing called the Zim V values, which is a way to pick, a dy dynamic parameters, it's called. So uh, the payload uses ZIMV values. So if we passed in something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, comma, 0.5 in there, what Zim would do is it would go, oh, that's a ZIMV value. I'll pick one of those. And it might pick 0.4 one time. Next time it runs, it might pick a different one. So we use ZIMV a lot. Uh, for instance, if we were doing something like style is equal to corner, well, let's do color, color, colon, we could say red, green, yellow. I think I was going to say blue. And what this means is everything that gets made from now on, say a rectangle, if it has a color property, then the first one will be red. Oh, no, sorry, this is randomized. So it will just pick randomly from here. It might pick green or it could pick yellow. And the next one after that might be yellow again, and then the next one's red, etc. So it's picking randomly from the array. There's also a series. So rather than passing in an array, this is another Zim V value for dynamic parameters. Now everything that gets made, the first one would be red, then green, then yellow, then it would go to red, then green, then yellow, etc. And series has a bunch of things to like say how many to skip if you want to bounce back, and you know, so it's got a bunch of things as well with series. You can also do something like, say, where the size of something, the width of something. You could do a series if you wanted to, 10, 20, 30, or you could randomly pick. So the array would let you randomly pick a width like that, Bob. Or you could do a min and a max value as well, which looks like this, min colon 10, max colon 30. Right? Then it would pick between that range. So th these are ZIMV values, which means I could put that ZIMV value up in the payload. And then it's going to pick when it, when it actually says, oh, all right, we're diamonds, then the payload will be in between that range. Well, what happens if you don't want to have it pick right away <laughs> when you get that? What if you want to actually pass as a value an array. <laughs> then we create a no pick object, which basically says, please pass this through. Do not use the ZIMV pick value on that. So we would say uh, a no pick, no pick. And we would put our array in here. And what was the array? It was 0.3 and 0.3, comma, 0.3. Uh, there you go. You don't even know what these things are doing yet, do you? Oh, it's 
an array thing there. Uh, what this is doing uh, specifically for the energy is saying how much to blur in the X and how much to blur in the Y. So we wanted pairs of those. The, that means that blurring is going to be a square pixel and a square pixel and a square pixel. Oh, sorry, not blurring, uh, the pixelation. We also have blur as well. That's down here in the focus one, sh the sharpness of it. But uh, these ones are for how much we're pixelating. And uh, in this case, we're pixelating the X a small amount and the Y a big amount. So that makes these rods that are vertical. And this one will make horizontal uh, panels, we call them. All right, but we're wanting to pass the array through rather than activate as a ZIMV value. Down below, here's where we are using that. When we make a new pixel, we're getting the energy's payload and the first value. So that's how much we want to pixelate in the X and the energy's payload in the uh, second value there. Okay, how much we want to pixelate in the Y. So that's us using that, and, and that's the reason for us putting the no pick in there. Comes up uh, in other places too, on occasion, not often, but for instance, if we have a corner, so if we've got a style and we want a corner, here, here would be Zim pick values, 50, well, a little bit smaller maybe, 20, comma, 30, comma, 10, or whatever. So what would happen is everything that has a corner that gets made from now on, we would pick randomly, and sometimes the corner would be 10, sometimes the corners would be 20, etc. So that's fine, but this is a case where corners can also be specified using an array. So if we did this, what this means, what we would want is an, uh, 20 in the top left, 20 on the top right, or sorry, 30 on the top right, 10 on the bottom right, and 0 on the bottom left. So that's how you can specify individual corners. Well, now we're in trouble. What are we wanting to do? Are we wanting to specify individual corners? Or are we wanting to randomly pick from these to get the single corner value for, <laughs> for all four corners? Well, the answer is, do you know it? The answer would be put the squiggly brackets around and say no pick uh, with the K. So that means uh, it wouldn't style it randomly at one of those. Instead, it's actually passing that array through and making corners of those values. Okay. Anyway, that's a little bit about Zim, but it, uh, and Zim V values are very powerful for dynamic parameters. It's amazing. So if you wanted to tile a rectangle, well, normally it would tile the same rectangle. Boop, 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 But if you tile it with a square brackets in for colors, then it's going to randomize the color of those rectangles as you tile it. If you're emitting particles, you might want to emit a circle, a rectangle, and a triangle or something like that. Well, if you randomly picked one ahead of time and passed it into the emitter, then great, you'd get a whole bunch of triangles or you'd get a whole bunch of circles. Well, so that's not what we want. We, we, <laughs> we want to save that choice until later when it actually, you know, inside the emitter, when it emits a particle, that's when we want to choose. And so the Zim V value allows you to pass in an array of those objects and then the emitter will emit randomly from it or in a series or whatever. And things like, remember we saw the uh, blah, 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 blah. Remember we saw the timeout? We also have interval. And one of the problems with interval is imagine that you were running an arrow function here and dropping flowers for a game. That means every two seconds we drop a flower. Well, that game is kind of annoying, even if it were 0.2 seconds. That's a lot of fast flowers. But every flower is dropping at the same interval. It's annoying. So what we can do is say something like in here, a min. What the heck is going on? Bar, go away. A min of 0.5 and a max of two seconds. So now we're going to drop flowers between. Every time the interval runs, it runs this value. So that's a Zim V value. That is different than saying rand 0.5 to 2. What rand 0.5 to 2 would do is on the outside, it picks the random number, say it would be 0.7. Well, unfortunately, that just means an interval that's going at 0.7 each time. So do you see the value in doing that? This is a Zim V value. 
And if we pick something like this, if we said uh, 1, 2, 3, that would randomly mean that every time it calls that interval, it would be a random one of that. What about a series of that? What it does is the first time it's one second, then it waits two seconds, then it waits three seconds. You could like play music this way with timing. <laughs> Isn't that neat? So those are ZIMV values and that's why um, they're important and they're important for us in payload as well if we want. However, if we want to pass the, the specific array through, then we use a new pick value. All right, I'm sure that that's fine. We've been talking about how rarity works. We have the simple way where we just have the value and the odds in a sense there, we call it frequency, or we can have a value, but also provide a payload for anything extra on that. And that just saves us doing a lookup table. We could do it like this all the time and then do a lookup table. You know what I mean by that? Uh, so that's 10% of the time it will be minimal 20% of the time it will be delicate. And then down here we would say arm val or something like that. Val's equal. Um, then we would have another object literal here with minimal and we would put its value which was 20 comma delicate and its value which was 10 etc etc. So like we do the same thing for the rest of the things here as well. Then when we go to find out, well, let's see, say delicate was chosen, okay, the 20% chance, and we've chosen delicate, then it would look like this. The num, be const, our num, it might also be a const, const uh, num is equal to arm vowels, so that's our lookup table, at whatever arms is, like that. You know where we're going to put that? So if arms is delicate, we get the word delicate comes into here, and therefore it finds the arm values at delicate and pulls up with 10. So that's called a lookup table. Well, rather than doing two steps like that, we decided, mm, yeah, okay, maybe we can build the lookup table in a sense right in here. We've already got these things. Why repeat them? So that's what we've done to provide this extra lookup table way in a sense the, and we're calling that the payload uh, the payload property it's fun to be able to store that property that payload property on minimal or delicate by the way these things are then treated our answer is treated as a string object as in a, I don't know if we need to show you this but a new string okay minimal and that's different than a, a string primitive this one's a string primitive minimal, minimal, like that. And a string primitive can't have a dot payload on it, so you can't put a payload property on it. But a string done as an object, you can put a dot payload. So in other words, when you receive, when you, when you have payload, so that one works, but the other one doesn't. When you have payload, like we have here, oh, I better do some undoing, huh? Well, I think I can handle it that was a value of 20 and this was a value of 10 comma 10 like that so when we have payload our result the zero result will be minimal or it would be many as a string object and the payload would be a property <laughs> go away payload would be a property on that object <laughs> ah, for crying out loud. The payload would be a property on that object uh, which means it was interesting. Unfortunately, FX hash, by the way, the, the default way that we would collect FX hash stuff didn't have this make primitive thing. So that was added by Zim. Uh, but arms being a new string like that uh, of whatever the, the answer is, that wasn't accepted by FX hash. They were expecting a primitive there. <laughs> didn't, didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? So let's take a look at the zog of what this looks like if, if before. So I refresh this and open it in a browser. I already have it in a browser. So here it is in a browser. Refresh. Hopefully it works. It does. And then we'll F12 and have a look at this in the console. Look at what it is. Arms, but it's a string of many along with this payload and some other things that we add there and energy and a string of these. So they're not really primitives. And now watch what we do here. We say make 
primitive, primitive, and it's a function. So you don't need to do this. We're sort of baked into the template. It should be there though. So just watch that. If you're grabbing this stuff from FX Ash, it may not have that in there. Could run into a snag. But we've tried to event that or, you know, cause you, you know, no, no, no um, extra work or anything or extra worries by adding this make primitive will turn these strings here, these string objects, string objects. Ready? Refresh. Did I save the other one? I did. So now we look, there they are. They're no longer those string objects that have the, the payload, etc. They're just normal primitive strings that will work with FX hash. All right, so that's a little bit extra. You don't need to know that. Um, isn't that nice? There you go. So I think we've got the system all worked out now with Rarity, it's very handy. We have a few other things that help with FX hash as well with respect to odds, but uh, we'll leave it at that for now. And I look forward to doing the um, the episode on the visitor. So make sure you check that out if you want to see how we made the, the visitor <laughs> do its things. <laughs> All right. Uh, take it easy. I am Dr. Abstract. Have a good day or night. And we'd love to see you at Zim. Zimjs.com slash Slack. Zimjs.com slash Discord. This has been Making Interactive NFTs.